Welcome, everyone, to this briefing brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. In Hebrew, our name is Abit Chonistim. IDSF is the leading Israeli organization advocating for strong national security to defend Israel. Thank you, of course, to all of our viewers, all of our supporters for tuning into this briefing. Today's briefing is very special. Earlier today, I sat down with Major General Gershon HaKohen, who is very much a thought leader here in Israel an IDF hero, a prolific writer and analyst of this war and many of Israel's previous wars. I asked the general about his views, um, what is happening right now, uh, the extent to which he believes Israel can destroy Hezbollah, uh, the extent to which he believes that we should be living in the Golan, where he in fact uh, resides to this very day. So I'm going to play that interview from earlier today, again with Major General Gershon HaKohen. Uh, please bear with me for a moment while I pull up the interview. Major General Gershon HaKohen, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank it's you. Great, it's a great, great honor. It's a great privilege to hear from you. You have so much experience and wisdom to share. So why don't we just begin with your take on what is happening on Israel's northern border? What is happening right now in the Golan Heights? Actually, what happened is a disaster that statistically it was absolutely a, in high chance that one day it will happen. Because if Israel uh, IDF is succeeding to kill very accurately, precisely, a commander of Hezbollah, then the retaliation of Hezbollah, as they succeeded to establish it as a rule of the game, uh, they are launching uh, hundreds of rockets toward Israel, toward Kiryat Shmona, Golan Heights, and the fact that until now, uh, two nothing be beyond. Israelis in Golan Heights have been killed from Kibbutz Ortal, two parents in their way, a couple in their way back home and that left three orphans. And it was just statistically that it happened. So no surprise that that disaster happened on Saturday afternoon. And the outcome is a catastrophe. Doesn't matter whether Hezbollah intended that target or not, the outcome is what making the difference. Um, just coming now from uh, families in the village, one family that lost uh, two sons and others in the village in Majal Shams, it is a real shock. And of course, the Israeli leadership, the Israeli state must give a kind of very effective retaliation. And as long it is waited, then it is less spontaneous, less it must be more sensitive to all considerations immediately. All uh, administrations in the United States, in Britain, in Germany, tried to create constraints upon the Israeli retaliation. An old uh, idiom of Jewish people traditionally said that Jewish blood uh, frozen immediately. It means that if we will not do that immediately, then we are losing the momentum. I don't know what will really happen. And the American administration, the White House, and all uh, the messages coming from uh, Blinken and others are that they are declared the Israeli right for self-defense, but, and this but is very, very dangerous, it means do something that will not uh, endanger the whole region to escalate into a huge war, including Iran. And by that, 
by saying but, by giving that limitations, actually they are constraining the Israeli self-defense rights. It means that you are allowed to take several acts of self-defense, but not to bring them to what is really required in that circumstances. This is the main problem. It means that Jewish people are still in the same position as they found themselves in exile along all the hundred years before, that even the basic right to defend themselves is constrained. That's the main issue now. My attitude, and I published that yesterday, and I uh, repeated that uh, idea again and again, that to understand warfare, it means to understand that warfare is not a, a train on a truck. You must sometimes dare to go out from the tracks of rationality. If all your considerations are limited to the definite well-known tracks of rationality, normality, etc., with all hesitations, with all considerations, then we cannot achieve the effect of shock and awe. What really is desired now is a massive retaliation that will bring in the other side a shock and awe effect. Maybe this shock and awe effect will not, of course, maybe not, bring the end of that war. It will not bring victory against Hezbollah, but it will deliver the message that Jewish blood and the other Israeli citizens living together in alliances with the Jewish people are well protected and we are retaliating as long as it is necessary. So just practically speaking, that shock and awe, leaving the train tracks, does that mean escalating to an all-out war, so to speak, with Hezbollah or staying below some type of threshold um, to not escalate things beyond a point of no return? Sometimes our leadership are really suffered from too much uh, calculations, from too much wisdom. The Jewish people are too much clever. And this is what happened to them in the Holocaust. Other uh, nations wouldn't come to that uh, disaster because, of course, uh, earlier, they would recognize that the end is Auschwitz. With the Israeli Jewish wisdom, we are succeeding to suppress reality, to create a kind of very uh, uh, calculated uh, ignorance. And are you concerned that if Israel escalates with Hezbollah, that the U.S. would pull support? Or that's not a concern, and Israel needs to do what it needs to do? No, that's the main problem, because what I'm expecting from United States is to say Israel has all the right to self-defense, whatever it will be required, and to give support for every Israeli action because we are fighting for our existence. Our existence is under a, a real threat. Actually, what's going on, and we must bring the Americans to that awareness, the European to that awareness and realization, is that all enemies in engaging with Israel are playing a double game a very calculated and very clever, sophisticated double game. In one side, Hezbollah, for example, they are gliding on the wave of empathy for Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They are just coming to give salvation and support to their brothers in Gaza, nothing beyond. If it will end there, they will end here. Of course, this is just exploitation of circumstances, it is not true. The other 
side of the double meaning is that they are making an excuse of all that rationale that getting empathy in the Western world, that they are just coming to be involved in that uh, Israeli-Palestinian engagement, but actually they are not at all intended to that. They are intended to destroy Israel absolutely, together with Iran, together with all other militias from uh, Taliban Afghanistan to Houthi in Yemen. All of them are dedicated to demolish Israel and they are united through that uh, very well accepted goal of them. They are all uh, directed by jihad. All the warfare is about jihad. It is absolutely religious. Amos Sochstein, for example, that supporter, supported by Biden, and the, he is a delegate of Biden, President Biden, to Lebanon. He's just trying to create a new stability, to bring a new negotiation that Hezbollah maybe will accept to go beyond 10 kilometers to north on the, to the border. And Israel will accept to negotiate about withdrawal from several points under debate in the border. It means Hezbollah will pay almost nothing because if they are going backward in 10 minutes, they can come forward back to the fence. But Israel is demanded to pay, uh, not cash, to pay territory. It means what Hezbollah are giving is absolutely irreversible in 10 minutes. What Israel is demanded to give is absolutely irreversible. And again, I'm trying to repeat what's going on with the idea of Hezbollah since the engagement with them in time before the Israel withdrawal from Lebanon. All those years, until the Israeli withdrawal in May 2000, guided by Ehud Barak, it was a huge mistake. The main analysis of the Israeli expert was that Hezbollah are just freedom fighters fighting to bring back homeland, Lebanese territory to the Lebanese hands. And if this is a rationale, so if Israel will go back to the international border between Lebanon and Israel, according to UN Resolution 425, then they will just bring an end to that struggle and they will not go ahead to find a new reason to fight. The rationale even before the Israeli withdrawal from Lebanon was again that double meaning. To the Western people, they presented it as getting all the rights as freedom fighters for homeland, with all uh, uh, the meaning of international border, but actually they exploited that in order to humiliate IDF and to bring Israel to that awful withdrawal in that withdrawal, we betray our proxy, Sadal, the Lebanese, uh, Southern Lebanese uh, uh, forces that work together with Israel, commanded by General Lachad. And since that, Israel lost the capability to create alliances with uh, friends beyond the border. This was the idea of Ehud Barak, that what he really had in his mind, his vision was in that metaphor that we are Villa in the jungle. It means our faces, our orientation directed to uh, Berlin, Manhattan, and we will just build the wall. What's going on beyond the wall is a jungle, we don't care. The other way to take the very serious uh, challenge of Israel to exist in the region is to say we are part of the Middle East, 
We are not feeling the jungle. We are respecting what's going on beyond the border. We are trying to create always alliances. But as General Lachat said, nobody anymore will make with you alliances, therefore, because you betrayed us. This is a situation, and even in absolute awareness, Hezbollah pushed Israel to that humiliation of uh, betraying our alliances. So let me ask you, with all of that background, practically speaking, in 2024, can Hezbollah be destroyed? It's a very a huge challenge. It could be destroyed before the withdrawal in 2000. After the withdrawal, Hezbollah became a strategic power, not at all a terrorist group. It is well entrenched in all Lebanon, from south to the north. We could destroy it absolutely in 2006, in the Second Lebanese War, because most of Hezbollah assets and uh, warriors lo uh, just located southern to Litani River. And we have been in the direction to enclose that force and to demolish it. Therefore, they ran so quickly to accept the ceasefire uh, that was decided in UN Resolution uh, 1701, because they had an interest. They realized that if they will not accept ceasefire, uh, they are going to be destroyed absolutely, and Israel lost the opportunity. They learned the whole lessons today in southern Lebanese territory, southern to Litani River, it is just first echelon. If we will take that first echelon, they are yet deployed in all Lebanon, including north of Syria. So it means that we can take all Lebanon and they will go ahead to land rockets to Tel Aviv and the negotiation will be could begin, I, I, of course, I wish that not, uh, by their own uh, conditions in the same way that Sinwar giving conditions to the negotiation in Gaza. Uh, this is a situation now, and it means that not only it is harder to destroy Hezbollah absolutely, now, Iran, what is absolutely new in the last uh, uh, era, will give all support. It means that it will come to be a regional war. It was not the situation before. It means that Israel will find itself in a war in, with, against all the region, uh, supported by Russia and China. It is a whole block. And if we will be isolated without support of United States, then it will be really hard. This is a dream of Iran that we will open a war in Lebanon. It will be against the interest of United States. And then they will succeed to send Israel uh, to the trap of being isolated, lonely, to fight lonely against all this a system of Houthi in the south, Hamas in Gaza, Judea and Samaria, a militia forces in Syria, dozens, thousands of them are located already in Syria, uh, from Iraq, etc. This is the situation now, and we must, at the end, emphasize the realization that Israel absolutely under an existential threat, very severe threat. They are not fighting just to get something by negotiation. They are fighting definitely to destroy Israel absolutely. And they are declaring that. Then we must take them seriously. It is not at all connected to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It is much beyond. And the fact that the world is still thinking that 
by solving, uh, of course it is unsolved, by solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, as Kamala Harris is saying, a uh, two-state solution will uh, give promise to the Israeli existence. It is, of course, a, a danger idea, dangerous idea, because if we are accepting that, we will not have basic necessary conditions to defend Tel Aviv that will be under mortars from Calcilia, 10 to 15 kilometers from Tel Aviv, with the capability of militia Iranian forces uh, 15 kilometers from Ben Gurion Airport and Tel Aviv. So what Americans are offering us in order to come out from the trap of isolation is actually another risk that we cannot take. General, you have fought in many wars. You have led Israel in many wars. I'm curious to know if the situation is more bleak, is more difficult now than in the past as you've seen it, or there is more reason for optimism now. What is your general take in the long view of how Israel is doing? No, I'm absolutely optimistic because I'm trusting God. It couldn't happen that all what happened is just a in order to bring Jewish people back to the homeland and then to destroy them. Uh, impossible to think it like that. But in order to win, and the route for realistic optimism, beginning by realistic diagnosis of the situation, and it is a very critical moment, more dangerous than 67, quite different from 48. 48, it was also a very existential risk, but in 48, all the world was under the a culmination point of it being exhausted after Second World War, and uh, they couldn't really do something about what's going on in that war in the Middle East. So it was just a war between Israel and the Arab military organizations that invaded Israel. Britain tried to in, in be involved, but today we are part of a new Third World War because it is not just a fight of Israel against Hamas, part of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that was unsolved. It is a part of a new world war between Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and the Western people. The Western people are really weak now. And the United States, after the withdrawal for, from Afghanistan, is really challenged as a superpower everywhere, including what's going on in Babel Mandab, in all the effort of uh, the Fifth Fleet to do something against the uh, Houthi. They did absolutely nothing after, of course they tried with the British, uh, thanking them from everything, and they succeeded to protect Israel from a lot of uh, missiles and uh, drones, but they didn't succeed to change the situation that small military organization, the Houthi, are controlling an international uh, route of navigation in the sea and the superpower cannot open it. And the reason the superpower cannot open it is they don't have the strategy, the operational capacity, or they, they just don't care. They don't see it as uh, escalating to a, to a third world war. No, it is a policy and a strategy. Uh, they are yet never declare even one warning against Iran, one uh, official warning 
actually they had to do that several times. They, the carrier Eisenhower was attacked several times by the Houthi. If it would happen to the Russians, they would destroy Tehran. Uh, President Biden even once didn't warn Iran uh, declaratively that it couldn't happen again because their idea guided by maybe President Obama is that Iran is the key for stability in the region. Before elections, they want just to keep stability to control the whole region from gliding to a huge war. And therefore, they don't care about uh, almost 100,000 Israeli residents that are uh, actually refugees uprooted from their home in the border. In relation to the United States interest, it is nothing. They just want their main policy is to try to prevent escalation in every conflict. General, I really appreciate all of your time. Final question, and I very much appreciate you taking all of these questions. Uh, you are a longtime resident of the Golan. What, what do you think is the future of the Golan in this war? Are, are residents going to evacuate? Are people going to stay put? Is the Golan going to be a safe place uh, for families in the coming months? Up to now, it is not a safe place, but I wish that people in Golan will learn the lesson that it is better to stay at home even by taking the risk uh, that to be aware that nothing is really under promise of security. And therefore we must come back to the uh, trust of values of pioneering in the frontier. The people living there must live with the practical ideas of pioneers. It means they are citizens with awareness that they are living under risk and taking all uh, what is necessary to take upon themselves to participate in taking responsibility to defend themselves. It means Israel must go back 100 years ago to the values of my grandfathers that came to Israel from Russia with Kumpeldo and uh, built the, the state. Major General Gershon O'Cohen, thank you for sharing that. It is a beautiful value to have, and it's because of that value and people like you that we have a state. So for those of us who are living in the Mirkaz, uh, under the uh, illusion that we're living safer, uh, thank you for all that you are doing. Okay, and we are trusting the eternity of Israel and trusting uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. Amen. General, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. That was Major General Gershon HaKohen. He is a true uh, leader in Israel, and everyone is encouraged to read everything you can from Major General Gershon HaKohen when you see him in the news cycle. Thank you to all of our viewers and all of our supporters for tuning into this briefing. We will be back with you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. here in Israel. Until then, stay safe, stay strong. Take care, everyone.